Hello and welcome back. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Angela Roberts, who will be speaking on building stronger caregiving partnerships through better communication. Dr. Roberts is an assistant professor in the Roxellen and Richard Pepper Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at Northwestern University. She is the principal investigator of the Language and Communication in Aging and Neurodegeneration Lab. Dr. Roberts has practiced as a speech language pathologist for 23 years, working with individuals with neurodegenerative disorders, including Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's dementia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Roberts. Thanks, Annie. And thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It is an absolute privilege to be with those who are in the room as well as those who are joining us from satellite and viewing parties. And as a speaker all morning, I've, I've dreaded that word live because then it reminds us just exactly where we're being broadcasted to. But it is a, an absolute exciting time for all of us today. Uh, so by way of disclosures, we have to post those. Um, my talk today is going to focus on conversations, different conversations than what Dr. Silver uh, uh, spoke about earlier today, but conversations nonetheless. And my work really does focus on the nature of the types of communication problems uh, that people with Parkinson's disease experience. And my work also looks at how over time the conversation patterns and the communication patterns between care partners and the individuals that have Parkinson's disease change. And it changes both from the perspective of changes in speech and changes in how I put words together, but conversation partners also can have a tendency to develop bad behaviors in the context of how they adapt to the person with Parkinson's disease, positive behaviors as well as some challenging behaviors. And so my work looks at how we bring a balance back to all of those things. Dr. Silver's work reminds us of how important communication is to all aspects of our life, whether it's getting out the door to get to a doctor's appointment or whether it's in the context of intimacy. My work today is going to help to try to support you as care partners and your loved ones with Parkinson's disease to try to improve communication in your everyday lives. So when I went back to do my PhD, so I was older when I went back, um, and I was older because I had spent this entire lifetime practicing as a speech language pathologist, and I'd become quite frustrated with the limitations of what my practice had to offer to the individuals that I was seeing. And these are some of the comments that come from some of the patients that I was seeing routinely in the clinic. And it was never lost upon me that the people with Parkinson's disease that I was working with kept saying to me, you know, it's not that I don't want to engage with other people. It's not that I don't want to socialize when we're at a dinner party with friends. But very quickly into the conversation, I start to lose my space. The conversation moves on without me. And then all of a sudden, I'm just completely left out. And I choose to withdraw. And likewise, communication partners were saying, you know, I, I can hear everything he says. This isn't a voice problem. I mean, sometimes his voice isn't quite as loud as what I'd like for it to be. But I have trouble following now the message that he's trying to communicate. His ideas seem disjointed. And they were saying this even in the context of Parkinson's disease where there was no cognitive decline necessarily or no overt dementia. And when we think about conversation, when we think about communication, it is critical to our own self-identity. People argue that language in and of itself may not be intrinsically human. For example, macaws and songbirds actually have a rule system that looks like the syntax and grammar that we use in the English language. And they use that to organize their bird song. We've all watched videos, or many of us have probably watched videos, where gorillas learn how to sign words for things that are in their environment. But conversation, the dynamic interaction between two people that grows and shapes and morphs as the conversation unfolds, is arguably uniquely human. And thus, this is part of our identity. And the lower quote here in orange is from a, a person with Parkinson's disease that I saw who actually long before her motor symptoms became problematic left her position as a faculty member in the chemistry department because her conversation and her communication skills were not what they were. It wasn't that she couldn't conduct a lecture, 
but she no longer felt like she had her identity as a language user. And so these questions kept popping up in my clinical career, and I was frustrated because they, people would look at me and say, what do I do about this? And I had to look back and say, I don't know. An important question, I don't know. And that I don't know drove me to leave my job, go back to school, take a vow of poverty for a few years, um, <laughs> continue that vow of poverty through early years of faculty. But it also set me on the path to being able to try to discover the solutions, not just to be able to disseminate the problem, but to discover the solutions. And that's what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. I think whenever I give this talk, it's important that we start with some definitions so we're, we're all talking about the same thing. Um, or else I ramble on and you're left here and I'm 10 steps ahead and that doesn't help any of us. Uh, but let's define what conversation is. Uh, conversation is defined not only as a mechanism that we use to convey information or a message or an idea. It is defined and has been defined since uh, research in the early 1930s as the primary mechanism that human beings use to create and maintain relationships and to establish their sense of identity. So with this in mind, similar to the woman that I pointed out to you who changed her career in the context of her Parkinson's disease, and this is true even in the conversation patterns for care partners, as they're trying to establish their identity as a partner, as a family member, as a spouse, as a friend, those relationships erode when having conversations are difficult, particularly in the light of some of the issues that are both central to Parkinson's disease, but also are adaptive to the disease itself. And so we've talked a little bit about this, but conversations are part of what make us human. They are defined as an interaction. Yes, we can all argue that we have conversations with our cats. That would be me. And I swear my cat actually does have conversational abilities. Um, our dogs, and, and, and we talk about this. I talk to my dog, yes, we talk to our pets. But this interaction between two humans is what we define as conversation. And the second bullet point is one that I really want you to attend to because it's going to be critical for the talk today, which is the successes and failures in conversations exist in a space between two people. And what I mean by that is it's not your fault as the conversation partner, nor is it fully the fault of the person with Parkinson's disease, but it is the interaction between the two of you that has fallen apart. And thus, it is the collaborative action of both of you that will repair it. In my line of work, and I was speaking with a colleague yesterday, we get really used to people with Parkinson's disease being dropped off at our offices, and that's at one hour time, and the care partner or their loved one can go get a cup of coffee, and that person is sitting with us for an hour, and we're supposed to fix them. And in fixing them, we're going to send them out to their homes, and all of a sudden, all the communication problems that they experience are going to be wonderfully erased. And that's not actually how it works. The argument I put forward to you today is that the interventions that we need to be doing, the approach that we need to be taking is a collaborative one. Because in that collaboration, when communication becomes easier, it is an act of self-care for the care partner as well. This isn't just about what you're doing for the person with Parkinson's disease. It's also about reducing your burden and making your life easier. And we know this because communication difficulties Conversation impairments from uh, literature in the Alzheimer's disease literature, literature in neurodegenerative diseases more broadly, has been shown to be a direct mediator of caregiver burden. It is not just that you experience burden because you are a caregiver. Communication problems actually mediates whether that burden is higher or lower. We also know that when there are significant issues with conversations and communication problems, in uh, the, the caregiving relationship, that there's a higher likelihood of be people being placed in long-term care facilities instead of being able to be cared for at home. So it isn't just the physical problems that get in the way. It actually are these communication problems and conversation issues that make the caregiving uh, uh, path more challenging. And then, of course, there are the negative impacts on quality of life, both for the person with Parkinson's disease as well as their loved ones. 
So this, I cannot, I did not find this. Ken Burns found it. He's awesome. Um, but Ken Burns did a recent documentary on the Mayo Clinics. If you haven't seen it yet, it's excellent to watch. But this was a quote that appears in that documentary. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, then go together. And so what I'm going to encourage you to do with me today is walk through this pathway of how we pursue collaborative work on conversation abilities and communication skills as a together. This means it's not going to happen fast. It also means that I'm going to give you some tips and tricks and tools today, but nor do I expect, nor do I want you to expect of yourself that you will go home today, immediately apply these, and all the problems are going to be gone, because that's not the way this works. If that were the case, then we wouldn't need to do research on how we design interventions and how we teach and train in this area. So I'm going to share with you lots of helpful hints today, but I want you to take those home with the idea that this takes practice and it takes patience and it takes time, but the payoff is well worth it. Okay, so this is what we're going to do today. We're going to talk a little bit about how conversations work. Because when I talk about things like breakdowns and turns and repairs, we need to be on the same page. We're going to talk about specifically why they break down in Parkinson's disease. And this is a very small area of research compared to what we know about the physical challenges and the physical problems and the cognitive issues. Thinking about how cognition and speech and language affect conversation, we actually do not know as much about. I want to raise your awareness to some of the mutual responsibilities of partners that it is both the person with Parkinson's disease responsibility to do something in partnership and in collaboration with their care partners. And I'm going to give you some very specific strategies that I hope you find are helpful. So here's my funny cartoon. Um, by way of full disclosure, I, my husband, <laughs> so this is a cartoon that is relevant for two reasons. One, it's what you people say to each other, right? So, honey, when you say you can't hear me, what does that actually mean? <laughs> but this is also what people say when they come and sit in my office. So, honey, when you say we don't communicate, what are you talking about? Because I think we're doing just fine, and I'm watching them going, no, you're not doing just fine. And we know you're not doing just fine because the care partner's shoulders raise in tension and squeeze and tighten because of the difficulty in those conversations. And the person with Parkinson's disease walks away and stops engaging. So we know it's not okay. I come to this place in a very honest way. My husband has hearing loss. He's had a uh, hearing impairment since he was a child. Conversation breakdowns happen in our house all the time. If you've lived with somebody who has hearing loss, you know this. And so a lot of what I'm sharing with you today, this, honey, what do you mean when you say you can't com we can't communicate, is real world for me as well. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about conversations. Uh, conversation is the backward and forward flow of not only an idea or words, but also physical body language, emotions, the prosody, and the, the vocal pitch changes that you carry in your voice. And so when a conversation works well, then body language and eye contact are clear. The topic is clear and everybody knows what's being talked about. The message and words are clear. The voice is loud enough. The sounds are articulated clearly enough. The listener is focused and attentive and present. And this is something that Dr. Silver talked about that is really important in everyday conversations. And speakers follow turn-taking rules. So here's what's interesting. No matter the culture, we know that there are actual rules that govern conversational back and forth flow. So this has been studied in at least 12 different languages across multiple countries. These rules are almost hardwired into us as humans. And when these rules are violated, it actually causes some challenges. And, and we're going to talk about how Parkinson's disease and some of these maladaptive behaviors that develop in the context of Parkinson's disease violate those rules. So when everything goes well, we have these brilliant, successful turns. I say, honey, I think you're the most wonderful person in the whole wide world, and you say, darling, you are also, and it all works really, really well. <laughs> that doesn't happen as often as we'd like. Um, the more common situation that we're dealing with is somebody says something, and you say, huh, what, I didn't get that? And sometimes that runs one direction, so one partner gets a message and the other one doesn't. And then in the worst case scenario, it actually happens both ways. What did you say? Well, I don't know. And then everything's lost. 
So we saw a bit of this, not to poke at my dear colleague, Dr. Silver, but it was really, we saw this earlier, drive, drive, no. <laughs> drive, oh, that drive, right? So that was a classic example. I asked her permission to borrow that because it was a classic example of what we'd call a conversation breakdown. Her mind was not thinking about that drive. And so she thought, well, okay, I'll talk about driving and cognition and I'm not comfortable, but here I go. So this is similar to the breakdowns that happen to us in everyday conversations. They are magnified and exaggerated and more problematic in Parkinson's disease, and we'll talk about that. So this is what my research does. We are, we are flies on the wall. So we've developed a bunch of sensors, and we do these recordings from in people's homes as well as in our lab, and we actually record why these conversation breakdowns occur, when do they occur, and how they occur. And then we develop treatment and intervention programs that try to stop those or kind of block some of the challenges that people are having. Um, and so we spend a lot of time typing out everything that everybody says and convincing them we're not sharing it with anybody. Um, and we get some really interesting conversations. Uh, so I'm gonna just go over this list and this is a quick bullet point list. So feel free to take a photo of this slide and then we're gonna break down some of these a little bit in, in more detail in the next uh, upcoming slides. There's multiple reasons why conversation breakdowns can occur. The first and most obvious one in Parkinson's disease is the quiet voice issue in the unclear speech. I just can't hear you and I didn't catch what you said. However, and we're going to address this, hearing problems are also more problematic in PD, and this contributes to issues. The uh, people with Parkinson's disease produce more word errors and more word slips of the tongue where they say something that they didn't quite mean to say. They're not always as good at paying attention and focusing, and even in the context of caregiving, the stress that you're carrying in everyday lives may make you as a partner not as good at focusing and being present in the moment so that conversation can be successful. And then, of course, memory problems can also contribute as do these unclear gestures. So what you just said to me was funny, but I don't change my facial expression, so you don't actually know whether I got your joke or not and these challenges of these ambiguous moments that affect uh, not just kind of how we get a message across, but how we connect in the context of communication. So let's talk about a few of these, and I'm gonna hit these slides pretty quickly so that we can get to the nuts and bolts of how to make things better. Um, so this is work that's been done in my lab, a little bit of work that's been done uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania as well. But when I first went back to do my PhD, we knew really very, very little about problems in communication and Parkinson's disease outside of the fact that it affects speech and the voice gets quieter and sounds become more difficult to understand. But that was not the experience that my clients were having and that was not the experience that their families were having in total. Yes, the voice was quieter, but there were other things that were going on. And so we set about doing this set of experiments and studies to try to figure out what those other things were. And one of the things that we find is that in Parkinson's disease, even very early on, it's not that people cannot process complex sentences, uh, such as the woman uh, who the man kissed uh, had long, beautiful blonde hair. I must be inspired by Dr. Silver's talk this morning. I just can't let that concept go. Um, but the longer sentences that have multiple clauses and they're slower to process. Now, if I'm asking you to process a single sentence, that's not a problem. But if we're in conversation and the sentences are flowing one right after the other and the speakers are changing, that slowness has a massive impact in that it creates a, a, a blockade. It just kind of creates a space where all of a sudden the conversation can't move forward. I can't catch up. Work that's been done in my lab shows that, that when people produce language who have Parkinson's disease, they produce sentences that have more grammar errors, so that creates confusion. They have more pauses. They tend to need to revise more frequently. Um, and in a study that we just published a few months ago, the, when they're talking or describing an event, they produce fewer main ideas. So that leaves you as the care partner going, I'm not sure I got all the details. Did I really understand what you were describing to me? Did I really understand all the things we needed on our grocery list? Did I really get what your needs were in the situation this afternoon? I feel like something's missing. 
And it's not your imagination. There actually is a good chance that some of the main ideas or the main points are missing. So we set about looking, as I said, these fly on the wall conversations. They really are lots of fun. Um, and the people kept saying to us, this is just a speech issue and what you're going to find is it's quiet voice and that's what the problems are going to be, but that's not actually what we found. We found that almost two thirds of all of these conversation breakdowns, those drive moments, those what, huh, moments, I didn't understand you, occur for reasons that have nothing to do with the voice being quiet. The voice is sufficiently loud enough. It's not an indicator that the person wasn't heard. It are these issues of not using the right word. I didn't follow what you said. The sentence that just preceded it was too complex. It takes me more time to process and I'm not getting that time. Um, the notion of just actually using incorrect words. And this behavior, I'm gonna put, that we see really commonly. Now, remember, my work looks not only at Parkinson's disease, but also Alzheimer's dementia, so in frontotemporal dementia. So I get the chance to kind of compare Parkinson's to other uh, conditions. And one of the things that we see in Parkinson's disease is there's a much greater tendency for care partners in the context of conversation to talk over what we call overlapping talk, the person with Parkinson's disease. So meaning the person with Parkinson's disease is talking, maybe their voice is fading away, and care partners feeling exceedingly generous and wanting to help jump in, but in doing so and actually covering up that person's voice, it causes a misunderstanding. And so this is a behavior that we see commonly. We don't see it uniquely in PD, but we certainly see it in increased frequency in Parkinson's disease across the hundreds of couples that we've now looked at. So we do think this is kind of a problem that either because the voice does fall off or the timing, these increased pauses. So we use pausing as a signal that my turn is done and it's your turn to talk. So when those pauses are really long, you don't get the right signal and you may feel like you need to jump in, but in doing so, we actually see that result in a conversation breakdown and more problematic conversation turns. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. I have to address this slide, one, because I live with a person who has hearing loss, two, my husband's a hearing scientist and an audiologist, so if I don't present this slide, I get in trouble when I go home. Um, and nobody wants to be in trouble when they get home. Um, and, but also because this is actually really true. Um, so this isn't talked about very often in the context of presentations on conversation and communication difficulties in Parkinson's disease, but we actually have this growing body of research. It shows that people with Parkinson's disease are at higher risk of developing hearing impairment than older adults matched in age. That's just a fact. Um, now, I will also say that hearing loss is the third most common chronic condition in adults over the age of 60, undiagnosed. So I used to go out and do these road shows when I lived in Canada. Yes, I am Canadian. Uh, and we used to go do these road shows where we'd travel around to 20 or 30 sites during the month of April giving these workshops on communication. And we would always test people's hearing and what we found that there were as many care partners who had impaired hearing as there were people with Parkinson's disease unidentified. Now, I must let you on, on a little secret. Typically, if I'm giving a talk like this to a room that has both care partners and people with Parkinson's disease, this is about the time the person with Parkinson's disease turns to their partner and goes, see, I told you, it's not just me. <laughs> you don't get that experience today. I'm not gonna humiliate you that way, but it does commonly happen. Um, but one of the interesting pieces that we see is when there's this combination of hearing loss plus the, the normal kind of conversation changes that we see in the context of Parkinson's disease, it actually increases the proportion of those conversation breakdowns by a third. So when, in typical speakers where the person And doesn't the dyad, what we call the dyad, the conversation relationship between you and your person with Parkinson's disease, that dyad. When we look at dyads, conversation breakdowns occur about 15% of the time, 15 to 18% of the time when people don't have Parkinson's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, early Alzheimer's disease, those increase to about 28%. 
in early Parkinson's disease, they're around 32 to 35 percent. Actually, more breakdowns in the context of Parkinson's disease than in Alzheimer's disease, even when there is no dementia. And then we increase that by another third if there's the presence of hearing loss. This is really easy because hearing loss is changeable. We cannot change the disease, but we can actually modify and, and improve hearing with the use of devices and strategies. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the conversation breakdowns throughout the talk today, but there's this other concept I want to introduce to you as well. And this one's not commonly talked about, and so I'm going to ask you to kind of stick with me a little bit here while I introduce you to another concept. We as humans, when a conversation breakdown occurs, intrinsically need to repair it. We are hardwired to repair it. We are hardwired to correct our own errors and errors that are produced by others. This is just what we do. And it classically happens quickly, right after the breakdown. It happens efficiently within a couple of seconds. That's not what happens in Parkinson's disease. And I'm going to walk you through what does happen. Part of what we see in normal conversations or in, in typical conversations is that someone signals, whoops, I didn't get that. So this was similar to, I have to go back to the drive example. So we had, so what you saw was, was this interaction drive. And so Dr. Silver says drive with an upward question is in, I'm pretty sure I didn't get that, but I'm going to signal to you that I didn't get that. Now, the person in the back tries to repeat the question, and then she adds a little bit more information. Drive? Further signaling to us that she really didn't have that this was drive for intimacy, not drive a car, right? And so we do this in our conversations. We signal, and that lets our partner know that we need a repair, or it lets us know to try to repair it. But what we see in Parkinson's disease conversations is this actually doesn't happen. The signals are ambiguous or they don't occur at all. And we actually see that people with Parkinson's disease are more sensitive to the need to repair than their partners are. They actually try to initiate the repairs and those repair attempts go overlooked by the person who is their care partner. And this is true whether it's spouse or child. Now part of that is that their signals may not be as clear Part of that is that you as care partners are also very, very busy and carrying lots on your minds and may not be as sensitive to how to pick up these signals. We also see that as opposed to typical conversations where about 5% of breakdowns are left as unresolved, what we call unresolved repair, so nobody ever actually figures out what the other person was trying to say, that actually increases to about a third of all breakdowns in Parkinson's disease. And when we move into Parkinson's disease where there's a dementia as well, those numbers go up to roughly 60%. We also see these repairs are more complex. This is not my doom and gloom. This is me saying to you, you know what, if you're seeing this at home, good for you. And it's normal. And it's okay. And it's not your fault. This is part of the interaction that happens. And so you don't need to feel guilty like you're doing something wrong, but we are going to move forward a little bit proactively to think about how we can make some changes that help to improve these conversations. Okay, so when we think about interventions, or I correct that, when I think about interventions in Parkinson's disease and this notion of collaborative care in the context of communication problems, I have two goals. I want to reduce the number of those conversation breakdowns, so I want there to be fewer of them, and I want repairs to be more effective and more efficient. And so we do this in my lab. We've actually developed a, a conversation partner training program. Speech language pathologists do conversation partner training all the time. We largely have done this in the realm of stroke work, um, when people have had strokes and have communication problems following their stroke. It really has not been applied substantially in Parkinson's disease. We created a unique program for people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and we have this uh, kind of approach where we train and try to increase confidence and independence with care partners and people with Parkinson's disease and using their communication strategies. I'm not going to talk to you as much about that to today. I will gladly talk about it during the break. But I do want to share with you some of what we teach in the context of this program. So our program seeks to balance expectations with abilities and motivations. 
Dr. Silver also talked about motivations. What are you bringing to the interaction? And, and that's as relevant for any conversation. Even if you're having a conversation about, you know, buying milk at the grocery store or feeding the dog, knowing what your motivation is and what you're bringing to that is incredibly important. And we teach three types of strategies. We teach strategies that we call mutuality-centered, and I'll tell you what those are. That's how to be in tune, attuned and in tune with your partner. We teach strategies that are really just about how to make the speech signal clearer. You know, how do we make voice louder, and how is your hearing improved? And we do these person-centered strategies. So you will have access to the slides to have all of them. I'm gonna talk about a few of them in a bit more detail than others. Okay, so let's talk about how we reduce breakdowns. Um, so part of this are, are easy behaviors that you can put in place tomorrow or tonight when you get home. And when we think about attunement, we think about the need to be in tune temporally or time-wise. We think about the need to be in tune emotionally with your partner or the person with Parkinson's disease that you're communicating with. And we think about this need to be focused on what is your intent or what is your cognitive status at this moment, both your cognitive status and the person with Parkinson's disease cognitive status. And my first rule of thumb is do not do what I do, which is try to have a conversation with your husband about the roofing job that needs to be done while he's walking away from you in another room and you know he cannot hear you and you've just gone over three budget quotes in 30 seconds. That's not a good idea. And you need to pick times of day very carefully, and you, and you as care partners know this. But what I'm gonna encourage you to do, it's not just centering those times around medication of the person with Parkinson's disease or when they're more or less fatigued, it's also paying attention to yourself. When are you ready to have a conversation that you know is going to be more challenging or might be more difficult? And choosing those times as much as a priority around when you're going to have the resources to have that conversation as your partner with Parkinson's disease is likely to have those resources. I'm gonna encourage you to really monitor. So people, this seems like one of those easy things, monitor your partner, monitor yourself. But I will tell you, it has taken us seven years to refine this intervention that we do. And it took us seven years and a lot of practice to realize that it takes us almost three to four sessions, almost half of the intervention, to train people how to be really sensitive and to monitor for indicators of conversation difficulty it's A-OK, -okay. I can put a list of strategies in front of you and say you should be doing this, you should slow down and you should take your time and you should give more pausing so that the person has an opportunity to process. I can put all of those in front of you, but if you don't know when to put them in place, if you can't read the signals, then it does you no good to have the list of strategies, no matter how well you know them. And one of the things that became quite apparent to us is that this missing of the signals was the key aspect that we needed to target in interventions, and we do that. We do that by having partners engage in conversations, watch themselves on video, identify opportunities where they could have used a strategy, and we practice it and practice it and practice it until it becomes second nature. But you can start today when you go home by monitoring your own emotions, looking at your, your partner with Parkinson's disease face for any indication that they may not have understood, an extra long pause, a raising of an eyebrow, a disinterest, a looking away, any of those types of indicators that tell us that they may not have fully have processed all the information that was intended. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the speech and language centered strategies that we do. I'm going to hit these slides very, very quickly, but I always feel the need to uh, expose people to this information. So speech and voice exercises, a lot of you in the room have probably had experiences where you engaged in a rehab program for speech and voice that did not work optimally for your partner and maybe did not carry over to home. Let me tell you, you are preaching to the choir, and as the person who delivers those interventions, I completely agree with you, it doesn't always work. But it does work for some people, and I want to share with you at least two interventions that are out there, So, and I'll hit these very, very briefly. So the Lee Silverman voice treatment, which some of you are aware of, is a high-intensity, highly repetitive intervention that's geared at strengthening uh, breathing muscles and the muscles that are used to produce speech sounds. And then the second kind of newest intervention is something called Speech Vive, and again, I can take questions about this afterwards, um, which is a device-based intervention that basically optimizes your natural tendency to talk above background noise. So that's preserved in Parkinson's disease. 
So you put this little device on, if your voice is too quiet, you get a little bit of background noise and the person's voice elevates automatically over it. So it's not cognitively heavy in terms of loading, it's almost an automatic response. And so we now have kind of two partnering therapies that we can use to do that aspect of increasing the signal, the clarity of the signal and the speech signal itself. And then of course voice amplifiers. Some of you may have seen these as well. Um, and I've given you here the ones with the black check boxes are kind of a recommended list based on people with Parkinson's disease that were trialed and tested on which of these amplifiers worked better or not as well for them. But Turning up the volume isn't always enough, and we've talked about this a lot today in terms of how do we create clearer messages. And so I'm going to give you a few tips. Do not do what I do, which is the example I just gave you of walking out of the room and talking at the same time. When you need to get something across, it is really best to sit face to face. One, you need the eye contact with the person with Parkinson's disease so that you can make out their mouth movements as well as their voice loudness. And they actually need to both see and hear you to understand what you're trying to communicate. So getting into the, at least that kind of what we call this three foot or six foot space is important. If you're going to change topics or you want to introduce talking and your loved one is watching the television, we get a lot of these on our videos we collect from people's homes, then just reach out and touch their arm or say, hey honey, there's something I wanted to talk to you about. Give what we call a discourse marker or a touch that lets them know you're about to start talking. That will make your life tremendously easier because you're not going to have to repeat yourself 20 times because they weren't tuned in at the exact moment that you started talking. Provide extra time, and we've talked about this, and I cannot emphasize it enough. Expect that the person with Parkinson's disease needs at least a third more time to process. If you want to go far, then you've got to move ahead together, and moving ahead together means taking the time to give people ample, in, ample opportunity to process information. Be careful about changing topics too quickly. So we see this a lot when we watch our videos. I, you're talking about one thing and then you're talking about another thing and you come back to the one topic and then you bounce to a new topic. Is anyone guilty of that? We kind of all are. And so what ends up happening, I'm sure that's frustrating for you, is your loved one with Parkinson's disease isn't following you and then you just get frustrated and it's like, I'm just going to walk away because you're not getting at all what I'm trying to say to you. And part of that we can change really easily. See the topic through, give time to process, pause, and then change the topic. Give them the opportunity to follow you. And these are strategies that we think about a little bit more in the context of dementia and Parkinson's disease, but I did want to raise them here, which is that we, as Parkinson's disease progresses, as cognitive problems emerge, then we do have to take more intensive strategies in terms of reducing the complexity of what we say, using words that are more familiar. But this really becomes much more relevant in the later stages. So, when we think about these conversation repair cycles, I want to give you some do's and I want to give you some don'ts. Do monitor for signals of difficulty. Do verify that you understood the message. Honey, did I understand you correctly? You're talking about, sorry, Dr. Silver, sexual drive. We're just going to keep this theme running. So, if you actually clarify that, then the person you're talking to can say, no, 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 I was talking about driving a car. <laughs> Don't go there. Or they can say, no, I meant that we needed orange juice, not milk, right? But if you feel like you haven't understood it, you've had to do that careful listen, jump in and actually ask, did I understand you correctly? Save yourself some time. Don't sit there 30 minutes trying to guess what they said. Ask, did I understand you correctly? Ask for help. I didn't understand you, could you repeat that? People are much more likely, and we all have stories where this is frustrating for us, but we're much more likely to, to be compliant with these requests if it hasn't already gotten to the point that we've misunderstood each other for five minutes and we're both frustrated. When you need to provide information back, repeat, and try to repeat it just the way you said it the first time. If you need to expand it, expand it just a little bit, but don't add whole new ideas to it. 
stay calm, and avoid being critical. That is both you talking to the person with Parkinson's disease, but it's also a conversation to have with the person with Parkinson's disease. Don't be critical of me. I'm doing the best that I can. This really is collaborative. This is about everybody kind of sitting together and deciding what are the rules and how are we going to help each other. And so if you feel like you're being criticized by your partner for your communication and how you're communicating with them and they're getting angry, have that conversation and say, what can we each work on to do better? What not to do, raise your voice. I'm not critiquing because it happens and I know it happens. You've been asked 23 times the same question, you will raise your voice on return. But this actually sets off an emotional reaction. People, people withdraw when there's been an elevated voice raised. It makes them nervous and it diminishes communication. Don't give up and walk away. We see this happen all the time in conversations, both the person with Parkinson's disease and their partner. Neither of you will have achieved anything. Stay engaged, be persistent, work through the challenge, and on the back side of it, you'll actually find what strategies worked for you and what didn't. And you will have made a connection that is much more important than the message that you are actually intending to convey. One last little slide, and then I'll open it up for questions. Whenever we start thinking about um, these rules or how we're going to change the rules or what we're going to do differently in the context of communication, um, it's really important that you negotiate those preferences with the person who has Parkinson's disease and they negotiate with you. So for example, if they want you to help fill in their words some of the time when they struggle with getting a word, that's say okay to do it, but talk to them about how they want you to do it. Don't ever talk for the person with Parkinson's disease without asking their permission to do it first and having negotiated those rules outside of that event. And one of the reasons this is really important is that behavior in and of itself makes people with Parkinson's disease feel and believe that they're not wanted and that their input is not valued and they begin to socially withdraw. And then you as a partner feel like you're having a conversation with somebody who's really not interested in you either and it becomes this kind of devolving process. Create room in the conversation for the people with Parkinson's disease. They're going to get left out. It's going to leave them behind. It's going to be slow. We now know that. One of the problems that conversation partners will often say to me is we're going to a dinner party, we're engaging with our friends, and I feel like I'm there alone. I feel like my partner is not right there with me. And it makes us feel like we're no longer this joint unit that we've been for all of our lives. And it's heartbreaking and it's a place of grief whether you're a child of a person with Parkinson's disease or whether you're their spousal partner. And one of the ways that I say is the easiest place to do this is people with Parkinson's disease aren't withdrawing because they don't want to engage. They're withdrawing because they can't find the space. So open it up for them. Start with a topic that you know is of high interest to them so that they can get into the conversation early. Refer to them and say, you know, Joe and I were talking about this the other day. He had the most interesting thought on you know, Audis versus, you know, I don't know, Subarus, which is what I drive. So what were your thoughts about that? What did you say about that? What was your opinion about the, the crisis that we saw in the newspaper this morning? We were just reading about that. What was it you said to me this morning? I found it so important. I'd love for you to share it with Sue and Larry. You may have to intentionally be the lubricant or the ramp that draws people into the conversation, remembering that your loved one needs a little bit of time to catch up. And so make that your role. Become the ramp. Give them a place and an ability to come into that communication moment. There's two things will happen. They will engage and not feel the need to disengage, and you will feel like you're engaging in the conversation as a unit. Okay, so I'm going to pass back that uh, slide. I'm going to leave you with this just for the sake of time. This reminder that conversations are the responsibility of both partners. It is the space in between that breaks. Yes, we need to work on speech issues, and yes, we need to work on communication strategies, but the breakdowns occur at this place in between. It is not your fault. It is not their fault. Don't blame. Don't criticize. Don't critique one another. 
Engage in this as a collaborative effort on how you're going to improve communication and apply strategies. Good conversation skills can be developed with practice. I don't care if you had awful communication skills even prior to Parkinson's disease, because I get that all the time. We never talk to each other. Why would we do that now? In <laughs> Spoken to someone who's heard that more than once, and I sit back and go, you'll do it now because it actually will make care of providing easier it will restore the sense of who you are. It will help you maintain a relationship as partners, not just caregivers. So you will do it, even if it wasn't there before. And it can be learned, and it can be retrained. And maybe before Parkinson's disease, it would have been nice, but it wasn't critical. Now it's critical. It is absolutely critical. And the payoff is well worth it. So I want to thank you for allowing me the chance to kind of speak with you today. Uh, it is that reminder, again, you're not going to move through these quickly. It's going to take time. But you will go so much farther if you'll pace yourselves together and work as a ramp and be collaborative and not think of this as a speech problem to be fixed, but as a communication and an active conversation that builds relationships, maintains your sense of identity, and protects the very nature of the people that you are in the context of providing care. So thank you for your time. I appreciate that. And I'm happy to take questions now as they arise. So thank you. I think there's well, microphones. Yeah, so there's, there's, there's microphones going around the room, and we have a question we can start okay. from our internet audience. Do conversation breakdowns with individuals with Parkinson's disease tend to happen in regular episodes, or are they more sporadic? Mm. Is there any pattern to this? So the, was everyone able to hear the question, or do I need to repeat it? So the question was basically about, are these regular, or are they sporadic? Um, the nature of conversation breakdowns or conversation difficulties when they arise are common enough to be regular. And so to call them re regular versus sporadic may not be the absolute best way to describe them. So they're common enough to be regular in that they will occur every day. But you may see sporadic spikes or increases in difficulty. And that can happen during times of the day where someone's more fatigued. It can happen in the cycle of medicines, whether they're on or versus off. It's also a reflection of who you are. So if the partner is more stressed or is under a lot of load of, of having difficulties, that brings an aspect to the conversation that makes it more challenging. So while they are regular enough that we know it's part of the condition, there are lots of other kind of factors that can affect whether or not they're, they're peaking on certain days and less on others. Hi, I'm Bill. I'm working with a wife that's advanced stations of Parkinson's. This is a real big issue I have. My question is, when I'm talking to my wife face to face, she doesn't respond until I give her name. As soon as I mention Judy, we're in a conversation, but I can talk to her a minute before that, and I don't understand why she's not hearing me. Sure. So. And, and you both, you have your solution, I think, embedded in, in what you're already talking about. So the dis, what you describe is absolutely true. So you're starting to have a conversation, but it's like she's not tuning in to the conversation. And that's frustrating because then you're, well, I just spoke to you a minute, and the important stuff was really all in that, in that one minute. Now I've got to repeat myself. Um, so that slow tune in, and, and we actually know this to be a phenomenon in Parkinson's disease where it takes more time to get tuned into an activity or to get tuned into a signal. Now that may be a hearing issue, but it may not be a hearing issue. It may be an attentional issue or a cognitive issue. And one of the nice ways to get around that is to do kind of what you already said, which is before you start into that one minute, do something, give it what we call in, in the linguistics literature a discourse marker, where you might say something like, hey, honey, or Judy, or reach out and touch her shoulder. Do something that kind of gets her attention and brings her more quickly to the space where you are when you begin talking. And that typically works pretty well, just letting someone know that there's important information coming in, so I need you to tune in. Now, we would think that our voices alone might do that, but that's not always the case in the context of Parkinson's disease. And so they need that little bit of extra help or extra cue to get them to tune in. 
Um, but that would be one strategy that, that might be very helpful. Hi. Um, I know you're focusing on the Parkinson's patient, mm -hmm. but what do you do with an unruly family member that comes in and either doesn't know or doesn't care about how they communicate with the patient and with the caregiver? Yeah. So, I'm, so thank you for that question, and it's a very important one. And I, it's not, I, so I don't focus just on the person with Parkinson's disease. The nature of my research and what makes it a little bit different than what's classically done in my field is I focus on the dyad, and that means anybody who's talking to the person with Parkinson's disease. Right. So this issue that you raise of some partners getting it and some people coming into the home who really don't get it and can almost put off what we might cause or might call an elder abuse type of pattern of communication, right? And we see that. Um, there's actually a phenomenon called elder speak um, and we know the negative impact it has on people. Um, so the way that that we try to counsel families, and we do a lot of this work. And we do this a couple of ways. Sometimes with the speech language pathologist when we're doing treatment, we actually bring in more than just the primary care partner. We bring in children, siblings, professional care workers who might be working with that person uh, to actually work on helping to break down. Most of the time, people are not intending to be awful communicators. They just don't know how to do it right. They aren't sensitive to the cues that mean that they need to be doing something differently. And they don't have the confidence to apply the strategies. And so we bring those people in and actually help them using video feedback and a lot of other techniques of reflection to have them be able to look at themselves and say, gosh, I see that when I, when I communicate that way, I see that changes my dad's face. Or I can see him pull back. That's not what I want. And so sometimes it is just raising that awareness, but it takes some time and we have to do that over several sessions. So that's one part of it. Um, you can do a bit of that even at home, right? Just by having this kind of conversation around, you know, watch your dad's face when you talk to him that way or when you go too fast or when you're not giving him enough time to respond. Um, do you see how he withdraws? That's an indicator that he's not following you or that this conversation problem is actually having a negative effect on his self-esteem. So some of that you can actually do, sometimes that works within families, other times they need professionals, social workers, people like me uh, to come from the outside and, and actually help families work through these issues. It's not always as simple because there can be lots of emotional baggage as to why people are doing that, right? Um, so part of it is knowledge. Part of it is confidence. Part of it is breaking down old behaviors. Um, sometimes that can be done relatively easily by just raising awareness. Other times it takes more professional help. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so your point, the, the follow-up question was they have to have a motivation and they have to want to. And that's absolutely true. I, I think, you know, my professional experience would say to me that most of us don't walk around with the intentional, this is, I mean, I say most intentionally. Most of us don't walk around with the intention of hurting someone that we care about or someone that we're providing care for. That when that happens, we're doing it either out of our own emotional space where we're having challenges or we're doing it because we don't have knowledge or confidence to, to do anything differently or awareness. Um, so yes, they have to want to, but there's a way to sometimes bring people to the want to space. Um, and that's part of what we do as clinicians. Mm -hmm. So many Parkinson's patients have a masking. Yeah. So you say, look, at, look for signals. I mean, so what are your strategies? To, to, I get no, when I talk to my husband, I often don't get a, uh, any clues as to what he's thinking. And it takes him a long time to come out with his, what he's thinking. So as a caregiver, what strategy can I use to get mm -hmm. past that? Yeah, so then thank you for that question. This is one of the challenges of living with Parkinson's disease, right? Or living with someone who has Parkinson's disease is those nonverbal cues that we have developed an entire lifetime learning how to read no longer work as well. And the added piece to that is that they're also no longer as well able to read your cues. Right, so this isn't just a one-way issue. It takes them longer to process your cues also when they're, they're just in the gestural domain. So I think it's about, uh, in, you know, 
being more intentional with doing things as I kind of skirted over in the last slide because of time. And so I'll, I'll expand on that a little bit more here, but it's being more direct with, did I understand you correctly? So time, right? So even if there's that time gap, and even though you may not be able to see their facial expressions changing, you have this pause that you know is this more pregnant pause that's kind of out there that you know something's, you have this sense that something what didn't quite get in. So just ask the question or go ahead and, and initiate a revision. So I was saying that the first roofing estimate is $2,300. What do you think about that? Right, so if you've just said the first estimate was 2300, the second estimate was 3500, and you've given a lot of information, step back and break that down and then give that person a chance to process and come in and then move. But it, it really is, you, you are not as dependent on those as you are about doing these overt ask for requests, these revisions, reformulations, kind of reaching out and doing what we call verifying strategy. So verify that you understood before you move forward, add clarification if it looks like that was not clearly understood. And that doesn't mean that conversations move faster, right? But they'll move a little bit faster than when it's just that dead zone in the middle. But ultimately what you'll be able to do is just move the content forward. And that's, that's what you want to do, even if it takes a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. Question from our internet audience. My partner's speech is becoming unintelligible, very difficult to understand at times. Should we resort to sign language, or are there some communication technology or tools that, we sh that you would recommend, and when should we consider using aids for communication? Of course. Um, so in our field, so this is, much, this is that signal problem. The signal just is not coming through clearly, and how do we boost the signal? In accessibility to intervention, so I know this came from our uh, kind of remote audience, accessibility to interventions does differ. Um, we know that access to high quality interventions for speech and communication problems in Parkinson's disease is problematic. Um, but I'm going to answer the question as if full resources were available. And there's a couple of things to think about. Traditional behavioral exercise interventions, such as the Lee Silverman voice treatment, have been researched for years and they do work well for many individuals, um, especially in the earlier stages of the disease. In terms of when to seek treatment, at the very first sign that you're having trouble communicating, you should seek treatment. We do the same thing if you have high blood pressure. We do the same thing if your sugars are out of whack. But somehow we like to let these more communication type of problems or physical problems wait till the very last stage before we intervene. And that's not what we want. So we want people coming in early. There's a new intervention, and that's the Speech Vive device that I talked about briefly that's also available now really around the world, either through remote fitting with Speech Vive directly. There are some cost prohib uh, prohibitions with that, uh, uh, but as there are with all interventions. Um, but the Speech Vive device doesn't require people to do as much of that intensive practice in a clinic, so it can be done and fitted in a more remote way. Um, it also is good for people who can't focus on making their voice louder or the increased effort that's required because it's more of an automatic piece. Um, we do have augmentative com computer-based ways of having people to communicate with one another um, that we use in the stroke world and in, in other populations. The answer of going to sign language is a little bit tough, um, and that's because we see some of the same language problems that might be there in spoken language might also be there in signing. So difficulty retrieving words. And, and then you have two, signing is a very dynamic, uh, my, my husband signs, signing is an extremely dynamic way of communicating. And, and if one of the limbs is more affected than the other in the asymmetry in Parkinson's disease, it can create some challenges. So I'm not sure that would be fully the answer. I think there's some other routes we could go through first with a speech pathologist. Okay, thank you. I will be around. I'm happy to take more questions during the break. I appreciate your time and very much. I appreciate your attentiveness. So have a wonderful rest of your day.